Welcome to this week's episode of The Future of XYZ. I'm so excited to have my friend Natasha Jen on the show. We are going to be talking about the future of design education. Uh, and Natasha knows a little bit or more than a little bit about this as someone who was educated in design at the uh, School of Visual Arts here in New York City and is a longtime New Yorker and for almost a decade, um, a partner at Pentagram, which perhaps is, you know, maybe one of the world's best known and certainly the world's largest independent design firm with accolades beyond measure. Natasha herself is a four time uh, National Design Award nominee and works with technology clients from Google and most recently a whole rebrand for Waze, which is very exciting, uh, as well as cultural institutions, including the storefront for art and architecture, where she is also on the board. So Natasha, thanks so much for joining us on Future of XYZ today. Thanks so much for having me, Lisa. Great to see you. And you. So let's just start out. First of all, let's talk about what is design education? Well, design education is um, design and education and teaching about design and learning about design and um, the learning um, and the teaching um, is two parts, right? One is really the thinking part and then there's the hands-on part. That's a very sort of brief, you know, um, explanation on design education. It's good. And so let's just, you know, I always give my guests the opportunity to choose their topic of interest and expertise. And you wanted to talk about design education. So, and the context of the future, but the future is coming from where we are and where we have been. Why is this so important? Well, you know, I've been teaching since uh, 2013, you know, so it's been seven years, you know, it's, it's not too long, but I've been teaching for a while and I, I enjoy uh, teaching, but I've been teaching um, undergrad um, students and I'm, I also guest critic at grad schools, you know, um, across the country. And one thing that I, you know, that I, I've been thinking a lot about is really the fabric of the student bodies. Okay, so that's something that, you know, that I started, you know, noticing even before, you know, this, this really uh, tragic, you know, um, moment, you know, um, last year, you know, with uh, George Floyd's murder, you know, that just kind of really opened up, right, a lot of, you know, um, not just wounds, you know, um, but also a lot of um, really pressing issues, you know. So uh, d d design education, um, historically, and even up until now, um, is really elitist. Okay, um, and you know, most design schools are private um, design schools, which creates this very natural barrier, like barrier for entry, right? Yeah. Uh, you need to write meet, you know, certain economic criteria, or, you know, you have to take on a big loan. But in addition to that, you know, someone needs to have some general uh, sense on um, what design um, actually is, right? Mm -hmm. um, just like going to going to our school or going to any school, right? So uh, I've, I've been thinking about um, how we can actually really broaden um, design education, not in terms of um, inclusivity, but in terms of the vertical penetration, right? Because again, design education happens for the most part at the higher education level, okay? So that again is another sort of barrier to entry, right? How do we actually broaden that horizontally and how do we broaden that vertically is something that I've been thinking a lot. It's interesting. So I, I, I feel like I should take a step back because you and I, of course, I mean, you especially, but I know a fair amount about design. And I guess when we're talking about design, it can be so inclusive of so many different mediums and practices and disciplines, right? So if we talk, take a step back just to define des design in this context, we're talking about iconography, logos, typography, things that go into more of the graphic design side. Yep. Graphic right? design, absolutely. Graphic design, you know, I mean, we still call it graphic design. And, you know, when students apply for um, graphic design uh, departments, you know, the department is still called graphic design. But, you know, this term is something that I'm not, I'm, I'm no longer sure about, you know, from the point of view of an educator, as well as from a point of view of, um, of a practitioner. Mm -hmm. Because you know, graphic design um, is, is, is broad, is really the understanding and um, the art of visual, 
and language. It's mm. always a combination of, of the two, right? But what I've been seeing in, in, in recent years is this sort of very specialized discipline based or, you know, um, I would say job, very job specific based thinking on um, graphic design. So, you know, students would come in to the discipline thinking that, for example, branding is the only, um, you know, definition of graphic design when they actually don't have a broader understanding about, you know, for example, design history, like, you know, when did the term graphic design come about, right? You right. know, how did printing um, come about? How did, you know, uh, typography come about, right? So uh, without that layer of um, historical and broad understanding of graphic design, I see it as something that's really dangerous, you know, and also limiting to fall into this sort of applied thinking on graphic design right away, which I see a lot right now. Well, it's interesting. So, I mean, what we're talking about in design education, therefore, is multifold. It's, it's the design on the one hand, which is something that we all experience, whether we think that we do or not. We experience it when we go to the store every single day. We experience it in advertising. We experience it in our retail experiences or even like our cultural experiences. It's so present that we take it for granted if we're not in this space, I think. Yeah. And the education to get there, what you're saying is like, it's almost like kids are arriving in higher education without having had any exposure to it, right? It, it, before yeah. that, because I mean, my own humble opinion, at least in the US, we've been cutting edu arts education funding for, I mean, for decades on end. Yeah so that most public schools no longer have any arts education. So these kids come in and they think they might wanna be a designer, but they have this pressure to do something more than be an artist. Yeah. Interesting. And, yeah, and, and that you see, you know, um, less than like fewer and fewer public, public schools um, offer mm -hmm. um, design education, you know, for the very same reason um, that, mm -hmm. that, that, that you just mentioned, right? There's, you know, cutting in funding for, um, arts education in general and graphic design is under that big umbrella so you see that you know that itself again creates a barrier for entry right and then students of course you know are are under tremendous pressure on how to right on, on, on their on their future career right so when you're actually you know as a student when you're when you're sandwiched between you know two very difficult two very challenging, you know, conditions, the default behavior is, let me pick up something that's applicable right yeah. away, right, you know, um, and I, I, I find, I, I find that, you know, uh, uh, you know, it's a condition that we, you know, as educators, we have to really work hard on changing that, you know, that is, you know, first of all, how do we actually really communicate and um, help students understand, and parents, you know, understand that, there is tremendous value in starting your design education with something that's a lot broader. It's tremendous value, right? People don't see the value in that. So how do we communicate that there's actually value in that? And it's how what you were saying about the horizontal, right? It's like it's going, we need broader education base in order to go deeper. Absolutely. And how do we actually help, you know, employers, which I actually play that role. <laughs> right to communicate to say all you know um applicants you know such as interns new new designers that they have to actually look at their work outside the, the very limited boundary of skill sets skill sets absolutely that's required that's bottom line right right but, Table but stake. Actually, exactly what makes a designer a great designer you know or an interesting or a different designer or a designer that has your own voice is way beyond skill set that's vision right and where does vision come from how is vision shaped right vision is oftentimes shaped by the broad education yeah that is that is so well constructed because of course you don't end up with vision you don't end up at a destination without having taken the path right and you in along the path you learn you grow you get educated 
it, it, it continues. So I, I appreciate that perspective. So what is like when we think about the future of design education and what an employer such as, you know, Pentagram, who has offices in, I don't remember. Uh, 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 London, uh, London, New York, um, Berlin and Austin, Texas. Amazing. So global, global footprint, global brand clients, of course. Um, what is an employer, you know, are you facing an absence currently and are you afraid of an absence in the future if the design education doesn't change? You know, it's a very, it's a very interesting question. You know, first of all, um, Pentagram partners, uh, the majority of the partners are all active, acting teachers and professors in school. Mm. That's a, again, that's a very rare um, thing, right? If you look into the industry, and um, particularly like in the New York office, for example, you know, um, most of us teach, are still teaching somewhere. So the education component has been really important to Pentagram's culture. And we operate very much like a school, meaning mm -hmm. that each team is really small. And because each team is really small, the dialogue is very much like a classroom kind of di dialogue, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And of course, when we when we face clients, you know, we're the professional design agency, but within the organization, it's very much like like a classroom, and that's mm -hmm. something that we value, you know, a lot. Um, in terms of education, so, you know, there has been this conversation, which has been going on, you know, for a while, you know, within the partners in the New York office, that is, you know, okay, we've all been teaching at private schools, you know, like myself have been teaching um, at SVA, right, and um, I'm proud of, I'm proud of that, but how can we actually actively offer our knowledge and our passion for teaching somewhere else outside of again this economic boundary which is private schools right uh, Elit elitism really is what we're talking about exactly that's that's what we're talking about right how do we actually do that so uh we have been creating um several programs that are happening right now um so for example we have um created a program um with you know my my partner paul asher um initiated that with um you know city college of new york for example um, that we would, you know, create a, a scholarship program that we would actually teach, um, right? Um, and you know, there's there's a curriculum and all that. So what we're actively doing right now is putting ourselves out there to public schools that have design programs and mm. help them. First of all, you know, look at look at what we can actually bring to the table, right? For example, identity design. Is, is something that you know we've all been teaching a while we have a lot of experience hands-on experience on that and we think that we can actually bring you know um, great value to the students so yeah. how do we actually extend that into public school right wow. and the second thing is how do we actually mentor students particularly those you know who they're disadvantaged students right for example you know someone who is from you know, a more uh, complex family situation, um, someone who is, you know, um, BIPOC, how do we actually mentor them yeah. and bring them, right, bring them along the journey with us and really help them to actually break through some of the challenges that they're facing, not just, you know, from school, but personally as well. So um, um, several, of us, several of us are um, engaged with that, you know, that's with Mercy College. Um, That's there's, amazing. Yeah, there's a mentor program. Yeah, it's interesting the 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 idea of mentorship. I mean, we keep, I actually had this conversation with a friend in a totally different space, talking about the lack of real solid mentorship in so many spaces right now, and 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 it will probably be a future future of X Y Z topic. But I think that the thing that she pointed out and that I'm hearing from you also is that mentorship today has kind of, it, it doesn't exist so formally. Once upon a time in the same industry that we're talking about, you'd have, you know, uh, apprentissage, you'd have um, apprenticeships, yep. right? And and that's what we're missing right now. So what you're trying to do is kind of bring back the, the, the apprenticeship, but in the modern context for those yeah. who really truly need it is what I'm hearing. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, um, it's, it, it, there's no, there's no um, any sort of financial or economic economical transaction in that yeah. it's, it's, it's literally, you know, sort of handholding 
um, a young person, right? And helping them along the way, you know, be, you know, looking at their work, schoolwork, uh, for example, to really answering, you know, questions, helping them to think through some challenges that they're that they're facing personally. And I well, find and that incredibly helpful to myself as well. No, well, absolutely. It gives you the empathy for where they're coming from. And presumably also it benefits the entire industry going forward, because yeah. if you have more voices presenting ideas, we have more inclusivity in the presentation of the identities of our brands and the identities of our, you know, corporations and identities of our cultural institutions. And it's, it, it's, it's a very obvious trickle down effect. Yeah, it's obvious. It's, it's a very obvious, you know, trickle down and also like rippling effect because we do see this effect can happen horizontally. Although we can only start with very small, you know, group of people. And you know, when we think about like mentoring, is no different from parenting, really, <laughs> right? Where you know, like, yeah, you know, and and, and that takes time. That yeah. takes dedication. That takes time. That takes patience. That takes, you know. Um, you know, going through up and downs together. There's no fast track to that. Yeah. And and when we think about the future of design without the education piece, what do you see is like kind of, if we extrapolate from this conversation that the future of design education is in fact the future of design, what is the future of design without the design education? Well, the future of design without design education is pretty bleak, you know, um, to tell the truth, right? And the future of design without designers who are also really rigorous, who are rigorous thinkers is going to be pretty bleak, okay? Because, you know, we, things are going so fast right now, you know, and we know, right, like, you know, say five years ago, you would have, say, several days, you know, to turn around something now that turnaround time is cut in half and right. that is happening right across everything um that we do right so the speed of you know change is happening which also creates pressure on the speed of producing and creating work right and i find that speed actually pretty damaging to a designer's growth right but then the thing is that when a designer's growth is prohibited by the reality, which is that, okay, we gotta get things done, you know, fast turn around. When a designer where, you know, the population of, of designers are not growing, right? You know, mentally, intellectually, the future of design for industries, for all categories is not going to be good either. You see no. there's a loop going on here. Yeah. Well, and, I, and I think that's the most important thing about anyone who's not in the design world or is isn't brought up in that in some form or fashion is that it's what I said before, and I don't mean to repeat myself, but it's taken for granted. Yeah. And I've seen it over and over again. You know, the best business partnerships, at least in my experience, are when they are in close proximity to the designers or the creative directors, et cetera. Like when those two sides of the business speak together and work together, you have better success, you have better outcomes, you have better connectivity, you have better, you know. So I think that the bleakness that you're suggesting, which, you know, it's like the, the, the design Chernobyl without design education, right? Design Chernobyl. I like that. <laughs> it's a problem. It's a problem for all of us in every aspect of our life. Yeah. So if you were to be able to just have your way, let's say a magic wand, we have, you know, globally, because this is, a, we're talking largely US, but this is a global issue, right? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And in some places, like in China, I mean, it's even more because the education is very, very limited to the elite. Yeah. Yeah. What, what's the future if you had a magic wand or could be in charge of art and design education globally? What would you what would you hope for or wish for? I would I would I would want us, you know, including myself, you know, and, and, and designers to, first of all, deliberately slow down mm -hmm. and, cre and create time to 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 think, to meander. And I know this sounds really crazy because this sounds completely counterproductive, right? in this sort of, you know, in, in our, you know, technologically fast paced um, time, right? But I find that incredibly important. Yeah, to create, you know, 
exceptional work. It doesn't guarantee exceptional work, but slowing down and being able to meander and to think about something back and forth over and over again and don't default to a quick solution. I think that that will be my biggest hope, you know, and for myself as well. I have to resist the impulse right now, and you know, which I, I, I notice it happens a lot now to me, the quick impulse to jump into a solution. Mm -hmm. Well, it's what's being demanded, especially as you work with tech clients on the one side or cultural institutions who are budget sensitive on the other. I mean, it's really you're, you're being squeezed. Yeah. I think I'd love to just wrap up, Natasha, with that to extrapolate your vision for the ability to meander and slow down to create exceptional work or to give that possibility. I think one of the things that I imagine as you're talking about the mentorship or we think about, you know, an apprentissage is in the smaller studio setting, there is this, as you said, it's classroom learning, it's a dialogue that happens. Yeah. And in order for that to happen, you do need that space. So it, would you change anything in design curriculum uh, for the future of design education, if you could, to enable this? I think definitely more, smaller, I mean, smaller classes, definitely fewer students, you know, which again, would require more teachers, right, to actually take on students. But then you do need to have, you know, benefits to the teachers. I'm talking about public school, okay, yeah. to actually, you know, um, to, 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 to motivate teachers to become better teachers, to motivate more designers to become teachers. So there's that sort of proportional uh, thing that I think really needs to be figured out, you know, because right now what we're seeing is that, you know, classes tend to get bigger and bigger mm. and teachers are getting fewer and fewer. And yeah. that's not just in design, that's in American education in general. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, this has been incredibly enlightening. Thank you for taking the time Thank to join you us. For your questions, really great questions. Pleasure to be here. Thanks, Natasha, for joining us on Future of XYZ and the Future of Design Education. I hope, I ho I hope that someone's listening. I hope so too. <laughs> and congrats on all the good work you guys are all doing. It's very Thanks exciting. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye.